Good morning and welcome to Houston Baptist Church Online. We're very glad that you're here with us this morning and we hope that you're going to enjoy yourself as you watch uh, our talk in a minute. This is the sermon part of the service that you'll be seeing. Uh, we do a lot more than the sermon. There's all sorts of other stuff goes on at church. And if you're local and you're watching us online and you're thinking, uh, I'd like to see the other stuff, well, why not come along? The details are on Facebook and on the website and uh, we meet pretty much every Sunday at 10.30 at Coldrose Community Centre. You'd be very welcome to come along. You have the advantage that you have already seen us, so there's less to worry about uh, when you come. And for now, we're going to watch the sermon part of the service. This is the Bible talk, where we open up God's Word, try and explain it so we understand it, see uh, what it says to us. And so it's a big help in our lives. So we hope you enjoy this morning's video. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, of it whenever those weeks take place. Um, the, the letter really starts to move into, the, uh, so uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus are known as the pastoral letters and to some extent that's because they're written to folk, somebody in pastoral ministry and there's lots and lots of advice for uh, ministry. So if, you, if this was a training session for uh, ministry, word ministry, there's an absolute ton of stuff here. So there's an awful lot here that seems to be very specific to church leaders, Bible teachers, that kind of thing. But I want to make sure that as we come into this reading and the next one or two of these sermons, that we're aware that this applies to everybody, if perhaps in different ways. Um, so first of all, it really applies to anyone involved in word ministry, not those of us who stand here at the front on a Sunday morning. If you lead a Bible study, if you lead a KYB group, if you're involved in uh, evangelistic talks or one-to-one -one evangelism or Sunday school or youth work, youth talks, count everyone in, you're going to be involved in saying things at messy church. These are all word ministries and there's more besides, and if I've forgotten something, um, uh, please accept my apologies. But these are all uh, word ministry areas. Now, it might not be the same as what Timothy was called to do, but a lot of this will, a lot of what the advice that comes to Timothy will find a place in where you are as well. So please don't think this isn't about you if you're involved in some form of word ministry. If you are, you'll notice that I'll be leaving out tons of really useful stuff because it's not a, it's not a word ministry, it's not a training session. Uh, which if I was doing a training session, which the, the, I used to do those, then there's uh, tons and tons of stuff here that we would want to pull out. Um, it is a sermon. So but please bear that in mind. There, there's going to be something for you if you're involved in working with the word into other people's lives. Secondly, if word ministry is not you, if doing a talk of any kind fills you with abject terror and you have no intention of ever being called in that direction, even though there was fiery writing in the sky, this is still for you because this is going to help explain a number of things. It's not going to give you every answer, but it's going to help explain why we work the way we do as a church. Um, it's going to explain what a, a pastor or a Bible teacher, some of what they should be doing. Again, if this was about ministerial training, we want to go much wider than 2 Timothy. But it gives us lots of key answers as to why we do things the, the way we do. And it's going to help you to think through, I would want you to think through, what should you expect from such people? What should you expect from those of us here at the front? And what should you avoid? Who should you avoid because of what this says? And that's really important. There have always been bad and false teachers. In the olden days, more than 20 years ago, you could generally see them coming. They would have to drive to your town. If anybody was a false teacher, a con man, or completely unhinged, you at least had a little bit of warning and you could do something about it. Now, every unhinged con man in the world can get into your house down a broadband connection. So you need to be asking questions because there are hundreds of thousands of teachers out there, teachers on the internet. And for a lot of them, the main qualification they've got is a camera and a microphone. Those are not qualifications given by 2 Timothy. You've got to look for other things. So I really think in our day and age, we're exposed to potentially the best Bible teaching in the world and we are exposed to the worst possible influences through the internet. And 2 Timothy gives us some questions to ask as well about who should we listen to. So I'm going to ask Liz to come and read for us from 2 Timothy 2, verse 8 to 19. Thank you, Liz. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David, 
This is my gospel, for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy saying. If you died with him, you will also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we disown him, he will disown us. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against quarrelling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourselves to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Pilatus, who have wandered away from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription, The Lord knows who are his. And everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Thank you, Luther. So let's have a, a think about this passage uh, in 2 Timothy. Thank you so much for reading for us. Um, last time we were seeing how Paul endured when things were really, really rough. Do you remember? We, we were seeing how he kept going, even though his life was restricted, uh, in his case by prison. His reputation was ruined because everybody thought he was a criminal. And he's facing execution, so he's going to die. It couldn't get any worse, really. And yet... He says, I endure, as we just heard, everything for the sake of the elect. And one of the reasons given in this passage is the one that we just heard in verse 9, that although Paul is chained up as a criminal, the word of God is not chained, it's not bound. Uh, the, uh, one of the answers as to why Paul keeps going no matter what is because he believes the word of God is the cure for the fall, and you can put him in prison, but you can't stop the ministry of the word. To his own heart, he was still being chained, changed, even though he was in chains. Uh, Rome could do nothing about that. He was affecting people in the prison who were coming to faith, and people outside were spreading the word of God across the empire. You just can't stop it. And as a result, he never lost hope. In other words, the word of God in the power of the Spirit is how God changes the world one heart at a time, how he builds churches, and how Christians are shaped. It all comes from his living word. And if that's true, and we accept it that's true, then we would expect word ministry to be a subject of some importance in the Bible, and especially in the New Testament. That's exactly what we find. So if you ever wondered, why is it that as a church, and this wouldn't necessarily be true of every church, why is it that at our church the Bible tends to turn up all over the place no matter what we're doing? Why is it that when we come to appoint leaders in our kind of church, we want people who can teach the Bible? Why is it if we're going to spend a load of money employing somebody, we tend to employ somebody who will be at least majoring in word ministry? Then those sort of questions are partly answered that the, there are more answers outside of this letter, but they're partly answered by 2 Timothy. So we're going to have a bit of a think about that. Uh, we're an evangelical church. Um, I found through the years that we use terms that everybody understood at one point, but if we don't keep saying what they are, we tend to drift. Uh, if you're more recent to the church and you're wondering what an evangelical church is, evangelical is not another word for happy clappy. You could have got confused here. Uh, not, not another word for happy clappy. It doesn't mean non-denominational. doesn't mean it's not another word for free church. It doesn't mean informal instead of formal. Those are, those are barnacles that have accrued to the ship of evangelicalism, but they're coincidental. Here's my definition of evangelical. You can take me to task about this later if you think it's different. An evangelical church is one that believes the Bible alone is God's word, that it is sufficient for church life, for our beliefs, for our practice and for empowering our Christian lives. And an evangelical church consistently builds its church life out from that conviction. 
So an evangelical is someone, a church or an individual, who believes that the Bible alone is God's all-sufficient word and then builds their life and faith and practice consistently, as far as we're able to, out upon that conviction, rather than turning to other sources for, for that power. That's an evangelical church. And that's why it's not, um, it doesn't determine whether you are very formal in your worship or very informal in your worship. It doesn't make you free church or a denomination. There are evangelicals across the denominations. Uh, our gospel partnership in our region largely consists of FIEC pastors and Anglicans who are evangelicals and really up against it at the moment. So those would be evangelicals across the board, for example. It's why our church ministry is Bible saturated. Now, our ministry as a church, an evangelical church, is, consists of far more things. We do lots of other things as well. It's not just a case of all gathering together and listening to sermons. The ministry is much wider than that. But word ministry, I'm going to put it to you this morning, is absolutely central to a church patterned on what the New Testament teaches us. It will be there as the heartbeat of the church though we do other things, and those things will be informed by our word ministry. Let me give you this in a nutshell from the scriptures, just two scriptures, uh, 2 Timothy 3 and 16. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. So here's Paul's instruction to Timothy. It's got two parts. The word of God is sufficient for all things. Preach it all the time. Get it into every situation. Can you we could spend weeks on this, but we're just going to keep it, leave it there. Do you see the logic? Here's the word of God. This is the heart of your ministry. Why do we want that? I'm going to go the quickest way is back to the, the, the Old Testament. I'm just going to read very quickly from Psalm 1. We want to do this for our blessing and goodness. Uh, Psalm 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, the Bible, and on his law he meditates day and night. And then what happens? He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. We have a word ministry because the nature of the word compels us to have a ministry that puts the word into our lives for our blessing and flourishing and good and power. That's, that's my summary of New Testament word ministry. That's why we're an evangelical church. That's, that's what we do. There are lots of other things. If this was a sermon on what is an evangelical, we want to mention another half dozen things. But that's the heart of it. If that's true, then, we should see a real emphasis on word ministry in these letters. And we do. So I thought what we'd do just for five minutes is do a quick survey of everything 2 Timothy tells us, just briefly, about the ministry because we're going to see it crop up now and we did a few weeks ago and in a, and several weeks time i thought be just this would be an opportunity to just bring that all together just very quickly to get the vision that paul is passing on to timothy in this letter so chapter 1 verse 13 he says to timothy put follow the pattern of the sound words this is biblical teaching that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Timothy, get into you the word of God, engrave the word of God on your heart, follow those words, live those out, and then guard the deposit. What's the deposit? It, it's God's teaching, and he's saying guard it. How does Timothy guard it? Communicate it truly, communicate it purely, defend it from being added to or subtracted from. We had a bit of that in Trina's prayer that she was praying against. Mm. Uh, ministry where that can happen. Timothy, make sure you communicate this in a way that is uh, respectful and reverent and integral to what the scriptures actually say. Skipping on, chapter 2, verse 2. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. 
The ministry of the word is a generation spanning vision. It is one that exceeds our present moment and we should, I think, take that on board. We should be aware of that. What's Paul saying here? Paul is saying, I, Paul, generation one of Bible teachers, I'm going to die soon and I am handing off my ministry now to you, Timothy, generation two of Bible teachers. Which is like, oh. Uh, generation two. So Paul is handing, generation one, handing over to generation two. What does he say that Paul Timothy should be doing as generation two? Immediately look for generation three, who you can train up and get them teaching the Bible. And generation three, don't miss this, make sure that while you're training them, you're getting them to look for generation four. Can you see what's happening? Number generation one is handing over to two, saying find three and make sure they're looking for four. See, multi-generational. We should be thinking ahead about how we bless people through the word ministry. We can get so hooked on now, and now is important, but so hooked on now, we miss this bigger vision and we miss something really important. We tend to judge, particularly if you're a speaker, you tend to judge the success of word ministry on what happens this morning, or at your youth group, or at Count Everyone In, or at Sunday School today. But here's the thing, word ministry is a multi-generational ministry. We need to accept that some of our best work will be achieved after we're gone. Do you see what I'm saying? To think, what a great, what a great work. It might not have worked today, but that doesn't mean it's not going to come up in 30 years' time. Um, please indulge me. I'm going to show you a photograph of a birthday present I got this year back in January. Could I have the first photo, Joe? Um, uh, this, you might, I don't know if you know what this is. I didn't know what this is till I got it. This is great. This is an oak vase, okay? Uh, it's just a glass vase with a narrow neck, and that is an acorn. And so it comes in a box, you get your oak vase, and you get an acorn in a little bag, and you stick it in there, and the idea is that grows an oak tree. So that was five weeks ago. Joe, can you put the one up from this Friday? I got an oak tree in my house. <laughs> in my house. I don't know how this is working, but it's working. Seriously, five weeks. I should have a forest by Christmas if it keeps growing at this rate. I'm assuming it slows down. You can't keep this up. But... Um, Inside that, isn't that amazing? I've, there's nothing in there apart from water, and all it's used is about a millimetre of water in five weeks, and that acorn has produced all this rootage, and it's now that tall, with, I think I've now got six leaves on it. From, from what? It was all inside the acorn. There's no food in the water, nothing. The power is within that acorn. Interestingly though, it looks like it's growing like mad and I'm going to have a tree next week. But actually there's a, there's a proverbial wisdom that goes with oak trees. It's three times 300. An oak tree takes 300 years to grow to maturity. It will then thrive for 300 years. It will then slowly die for 300 years. That acorn has got a 900 year vision built into it. 900 years! Hey. If I live to be 100, it should be a strong sapling. And that's all I'll have seen. I planted it last month. I might live to see a strong sapling. I will already have seen by then it have various generations of acorns, which I tell you, be going in that pot after I've planted it every year, and there will be forests growing. <laughs> Inside that acorn are forests. 900 years and forests in something just that small and ordinary. I'll give you three guesses where I'm going with this. We need a big vision of word ministry because encapsulated in the word that we give to one another in our ministries right now is not now, it is, and it, I don't know how many hundreds of years, but it's hundreds of years. It's certainly generational. What you do today and you say, well, I don't know if that made any difference. It has got a future, and it's got a future where it's going to produce more seed. It's going to produce more people that are going to say more things about the Word of God to other people. So the vision of 2 Timothy is multi-generational. Timothy is being, Paul is handing to Timothy, who's already looking for generation 3, who will be told to find generation 4, who will be telling 4 to find 5. 
we keep going. Word ministry has a longevity. We need to be looking for ways of producing new, new acorns and new trees. But word, vision, word ministry has a huge vision. Thanks, Jay. You can turn that off now. Uh, <clears throat> chapter 2, verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. A word ministry should teach the whole counsel of God, but the heart is the gospel. Word ministry has to come back to the gospel again and again and again. And the gospel is Jesus Christ, God incarnate, lived for us, died for us, rose again and ascended, is returning in judgment. Justification by faith. This is the gospel. And in the end, the whole of the scriptures can be encapsulated in the gospel. It is the story of God's good news to us through Jesus Christ. So your word ministry, my word ministry, must tell you at some point, if not now, later, it must all come back. All roads lead to the cross. All roads lead to Jesus. So the heart of gospel of word ministry is Jesus and the gospel. Always look for that. Verse 15. We'll come back to this in a minute. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Those of us involved in word ministry, it is our responsibility to learn how to handle the Bible as well as we can correctly. We'll come back to that. Chapter 4, 1 and 2, we just read this. Preach in season, preach out of season. Preach when they want you to. Tell them the Bible when they don't want you to. Just keep telling them the Bible. Word ministry has to be relentless. There needs to be a certain amount of oomph in what you're doing because you need to say it even when people don't want you to. I've lived long enough now to find word ministry under attack seasonally the entire time that I've been doing it. It started with we need to have less preaching. What we need is acting and theatre on a Sunday morning. Those of you who've been around a long time will know I'm not against having dramas and uh, the years of after church services probably probably still scarred by some some of those yeah, but it was great um do it away with it what we need is what we need is drama no what we need is music no what we need is video no what we need is a lighting rig and special effects no what we need is every time every time every time replace it because word ministry is antiquated uh, in the 90s I had a very well-meaning church leader say to me, we need to, the problem we've got now is I read a study that says people's attention spans are now only 12 minutes. We need to reduce sermons in our churches to 12 minutes. And I said, no, people need to expand their attention spans. You can sit through three hours of the Lord of the Rings. You can sit through half an hour of a sermon. You can sit through three hours of the Lord of the Rings and not even need the bathroom. How does anyone do that? But if you can do that, why can you not sit here and listen to a sermon? That was the 1990s. It was something else the next year. And by the way, that's never decreasing circle because now attention spans are eight minutes and now they're six minutes. We might as well just write on a piece of paper and flick it at your head if we're going to follow that principle. People used to go and flock in their thousands to listen to political speeches that lasted three hours. The pro we're not getting better because our attention spans are shorter. That is not a good thing. So, yeah, some, by the way, you can still say that sermon was long, that sermon was boring, all those sort of things. But if you say to me, we need to do away with so much word ministry, I will say to you, I don't think that's correct. And I don't think Paul would say that's correct. If I was, um, if I was let's say that there's going to be a lot of medical illustrations this morning. If I was prescribing to you tablets that will save your life if you take them every day and you said to me but I prefer burgers will you prescribe me burgers I will say no if you will say to me but you've prescribed me 12 tablets I don't like taking that many tablets could I just take three I will say no you're going to do what you want but I'm going to keep prescribing you tablets I'm going to keep prescribing you 12 of them because that's the prescription according to your need like I say again, if you're saying, Alan, you keep saying they're going to be less than such and such a time, you never make it, that may be true, and I probably need to cut down. But the principle remains. Don't judge the principle by whether I'm too long. But what I'm saying to you is, that's the survey of 2 Timothy, you know something else now. But can you see the word ministry is at the heart of what Paul is... There's other stuff, but this is the heart of a Bible-believing church. So what does a minister of the word do? What does a, an appointed Bible teacher for a church do? I'm asking you really, what would you expect from someone like me? 
And this would be especially important if you move to another church, you move to another area, and you're looking for a church, what should you look for? What should you avoid? And if you do word ministry, what does it say here that's really important for us? Let me go through some things. This isn't everything, but it's what 2 Timothy gives to us. Quick as I can here. First of all, verse 14, remind them of these things. What, remind them of what things? He's just rehearsed the gospel. Remember that little poem? If we died with him, we live with him. Jesus died for your sins. You've died with him. You're living for him. You have eternal hope. Remind them of these things. Rem- they must have heard this a hundred times. But part of Timothy's ministry is to keep saying the same thing again and again. I know we don't want the same sermon every week. I'm so glad certain people aren't here because that would have been handing it to them on a plate for a big response about whether I'm preaching the same sermon every week. But, all right, we don't want the same sermon every week, but you don't want novelty all the time either. Word ministry draws from the one well, the Bible. It's going to be the same things over and over sometimes. It's got to be the same things over and over. We've only got one well to draw from. So we will remind you of these things. It will be, tell me the old, old story. We are going to tell you the old. We're going to do the old, old story. Jesus said, do this as often as you can. Why? Because you need to hear it again and again and again. We're forgetful people. And we need it rubbed deeply into us. We've got to find, we'll find new light on verses. We'll make connections that maybe they have been made before, but they haven't been made in a thousand years. We want new applications for the new situations that we face. Nobody faced the internet before, which is why we talk about, well, if the internet's here, then the Bible says this so much. We're the first generations to grow up with with the internet in our houses. We've got to find new applications. We need to find new solutions to problems that previous generations didn't have. But all of that is mined from the same mine. It's all coming from the same well of living water. It doesn't come primarily from pop psychology, from trends, from management techniques, from new revelations. We might get things from some of those things, but the source is the Bible. Word ministry will remind you of these things. This is the soil from which your Christian life will grow, and we've got to get them deeply in. The gospel isn't the way into the Christian life only, it is the way of the Christian life, over and over and over again. Number one, Bible ministry reminds you of things. Number two, charge them before God or warn them before God about these things. Word ministry should comfort and assure you because the Bible does that, but it also tells you do this, don't do that, these will be the consequences. The Bible teacher has to be able to speak with an element of authority on what should and shouldn't be the case, to warn and to charge before God. Now, before you panic when I'm talking about teaching with authority, we say something about that. When I was at college, we were still dealing with the normal things that ministers crashed and burned over, were running off with the money or running off with the organist. Now, clergy are crashing and burning because they are above accountability and whacking people all the time. So when I say that the Bible teacher preaches with authority, that authority is not contained within the Bible teacher, that authority is derived from the scriptures. Which means in a church like ours, I and the other teachers say, you should do this, we hold you accountable, and your job, make sure we're telling the truth from the Bible, and you hold us accountable. Do you see that circle, how it works? It's got, no, no system is perfect, but it's a pretty good one, right? You appoint us to teach you authoritatively from the scriptures, but that authority only goes as far as we're scriptural. So if we tell you something that you say, that's in the Bible, you need to take it seriously. If we're teaching you something that's not in the Bible, you can ignore it completely, and you should come and tell us afterwards. So we remind, but we also charge and warn before God. We say comforting things, but we've got to tell you about hell. We've got to tell you about the consequences of disobeying the word of God. And remember, we're telling ourselves at the same time. If you think that preachers from the front only preach on things that they've 100% got the hang of, if that was true, there'd be very, very short sermons. We really would be flicking a piece of paper at your head. Like doctors, do you know sometimes I've met health professionals and you find them out the back having a fag, and you think, hang on a minute, <laughs> how, does, how does that work? 
Well, you know, they obviously haven't quite got the hang of everything, but the medical advice they're giving you is still true. They might be telling you to give up smoking and they're out about smoking, but it's still true. We haven't got the hang of everything, but we are commissioned to tell you everything. Do you see what I mean? As long as it's biblical. Fit of 15, we have to rightly handle the Word of God. So an appointed Bible teacher for a church should know their Bible well. They should have been studying it. They should study it. They should explore it. They should be interested in it. They should want to know what it says. They should be reflecting on it. A Bible teacher should have a reasonable grasp of the whole of the Scriptures and the parts and how the parts fit into the whole. Because it says here, we have to handle it, or if you've got an older translation, rightly divide, cut. So if you're working in wood, you could be an ignoramus like me and just go to whatever shop actually has got wood there and say, I'd like some wood for this job. But if you really know what you're doing, you know what kind of wood you want, you know what quality it should be, you know whether it should have been pressure treated or not treated, you know which kind of woods will work in this role and won't work in this role, you know that if you're going to use different kind of woods, they're going to have different expansion and contraction rates, they're going to have different levels of oil that are going to secrete, you're going to know how they're going to go together, and if all your joints are going to fall apart because one's going to expand and one's going to contract, you want to know where the grain is, how to cut with the grain, when to cut across the grain. That's how woodworking really works and I know because I read that somewhere <laughs> and I get other people to do it properly for me. And so it is with the scriptures. If we're going to say what you need is this bit of the scriptures, we need to know how that fits into the whole. Do you see what I'm saying? If, if again, if it was a pharmacist, I want my pharmacist to understand some biology, some chemistry, how drugs interact with my body, how drugs interact with each other, what the purpose of the individual drugs are for, what they're going to achieve if you put two of them together. What I don't want is a pharmacist who's going to say, well, that looks nasty. I tell you what, I had some antibiotics that were good for my chest infection. Why don't you rub them on your broken leg? I'm sure they work for that as well. Or, I love the colour blue. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you all the blue tablets that I've got and take them all. I'm pretty confident that's going to help. See, now you've got a pharmacist that does not know rightly how to divide pharmacy. You want somebody that's got an idea about these things. Now, when I say all this, it doesn't mean you need a degree in theology. But what you want in your church teachers is the ability to rightly handle it. Perfectly? Not going to happen. But who have put in that into their hearts, who are moving in that direction, that is in what their ambition is. Which means, it says here, they have got to be a worker. Uh, where am I? Sorry, I've lost my place here. Uh, do you best present yourself to God as approved? A worker. We want people who put an effort into it. Do you know what? Bible teaching takes effort. If you've ever preached your first sermon, or if you ever go into, you'll get to the end and you will say, why am I so tired? The first time you preach, this is my experience, you start feeling sick on Wednesday, and then by Sunday afternoon you're unconscious, and you say to yourself, I'm never doing that again. And that is a common experience because of the effort that goes into it. You don't want a Bible teacher who's lazy, who's going to wing it, who's going to plagiarise. You learn from everyone, but you never cheat. The value of a local Bible teacher over and above an itinerant teacher or an internet teacher is this person cares about the scriptures and they care about you because they know you. And the power is in bringing those two things together. Let me give the caveat to that. If you are a Bible teacher of any description in this church, let me just surround that with qualifications. I am full time and everyone else is not. That means you inevitably have less time than I do to prepare your Bible talks. I am not saying you have to put in the time that possibly even all of us at the front can do and certainly not the full-time employer of the church can do. Do not beat yourself up because you don't have that time. Don't quit because you don't have that time. If you're a preacher and you got to read three pages of a commentary before you got here, don't quit or beat yourself up. If your youth talk is only half done because you finish late at work and the kids threw up over something and that's all you could do, you don't quit and give up. A long time ago, uh, a minister who knew the doc Dr Lloyd-Jones said, he said this, said to me when I was on a placement, um, it, words to this effect, there is a difference between presumption and depending on the providence of God. 
There is a difference between presumption and depending on the providence of God. Saying, oh, wing it. I've done talks before. I'll be fine. There's something on the telly anyway. I haven't got any... It'll be fine. I'll just make it up when I get there. That's presumption. There is no assurance that God will help you one job. You've put in the time that you had in and around your actual job, in and around all the other responsibilities that you've got. You've done what you can. Trust God's provision. He will do what you cannot imagine through whatever you've been able to sincerely bring to the table. Do you know, some will will tell you, not going against the acorn, I'm still waiting for some of these acorns to come up. You will do the best sermon that you've ever done and nobody ever says anything. And you, you think everybody was asleep. They may well have been. You turn up because you've been under massive pressure. You've hardly got anything done. You stand up, you blurt it all out and somebody will come up and say to you, that's just resolved the biggest problem in my life. Now what you don't say after that is, well I am not preparing in the future because clearly winging it works. That's presumption. What you were doing was trusting in the providence of God with the time that you have and God owned it and did something with it. Don't give in or quit because you don't have as much time as the full-time person. If you care about the scripture, if you care about the people, children, young people that you're talking to, and you've done what you can, you are not being lazy. You are not being presumptuous. He will provide. So get in there and put the fuel on the table and he will light it for you. And finally, it says you should be approved by God. To whom is the Bible teacher accountable? To God. That can be abused. It is abused. It doesn't mean you can't question me. I answer to God. He's my boss. Take it up with my boss. He told me to say this. That is not what that means. What it means is this. The priority of a Bible teacher is that they handle the God's word, God's way, so God will own it. And you want that. You want that in your Bible teacher, that they believe that God is watching what they do and he is their primary audience. Because otherwise you've got the problem in chapter 4 verse 3. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and they will depart from the truth. If you have a Bible teacher that only wants to do what people tell him to do, then you will have a problem. If you have a Bible teacher that believes God is the primary accountability person here, they will stick to what the Bible says. So that's what you're looking for. Will you find someone perfect? No. Fat chance. But you will find people heading in the right direction with an ambition like this. If you need to decide on a church and you need to look at the ministry there, these are the things that you're looking for. If you're in word ministry, these are the things to take to heart. As a result of that, Paul then says, steer clear of certain people. And I'm going to finish with this before we come to communion. Looking very quickly at the case in hand. Verse 17 Uh, There are these people who are talking nonsense, babble. Their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting or overturning the faith of some. Here are two people who are bad teachers. They must be prominent amongst the bad teachers because they get named as people to avoid. And they have created two related problems. Number one. They have swerved from the truth. They have left the old, old story. They are not reminding people. They are not digging from the well. They've taken a biblical idea and then they've twisted it in their own new direction. This is what I mean about avoiding that which is new. I don't mean our services should sound like it's 1642. I mean that we shouldn't be head up on, here's a great new idea. You remember what Paul said about the philosophers in Athens? All they want is new stuff. He says here, remind them of the old, old story. These two didn't. And as a result, they're causing quarrels. They have departed from the word. So what they're saying is merely words. And now they're arguing about it. What is quarrelling? Arguing to win, to come out on top for authority and supremacy. Now, it's a very weird teaching. You might say, they're claiming the resurrection has already happened. Who's going to believe that? Man, if the resurrection had already happened, I would have noticed. No more migraines. No more my hips on fire this would be and you would have a list of the same things if the resurrection had happened i would have clocked it i wouldn't have missed it so who's going to believe a mad idea like this let me tell you what i probably what they were probably saying they're saying hey the resurrection it's happened already because it was a spiritual resurrection does that sound familiar sound like any archbishops you might have bumped into over the years 
Perhaps they said this, it's a spiritual resurrection and now we are living at a higher plane to other people. We're in a higher Christian life. We are in a, a completely different category of Christians. Sound familiar? Old Keswick, holiness teaching, fringe Pentecostal stuff where you've become like a super Christian. Ever come across those things? As a result of my new higher life, and I am now raised above this life, my physical life is no longer of any great importance. Biblical ethics doesn't really apply to me. I don't need to worry about the commandments. Physically, I can do whatever I like. Well, there's plenty of people teaching that. See, already, it's not quite as bonkers as you think. It's quite an appealing teaching in some ways. All you need is that kind of thing that sounds spiritual and a compelling personality, and you've got people who are led astray. Paul says it's a disease. It's like gangrene spreading through the body. It'll need to be amputated. It's poisoning things. Verse 14, it produces nothing good. It brings people to ruin. That is literally the word catastrophe. If you can see that in Greek, it's catastrophe. It's causing catastrophes. Verse 16, it's causing godlessness. Verse 18, it's overturning some people's faith. What's Paul's response to this? Timothy, avoid them. Tell other people to avoid them. I'm going to finish quickly, as I can now, by saying, let me give you some things to avoid on the basis of this. Let me tell you some people to avoid. Number one, Bible teachers who place themselves above accountability. You cannot touch the Lord's anointed. I've heard Bible teachers say this. I am right. You must not touch. This is Saul and, and David. You must not touch the Lord's anointed. People who have been so famous they can't be wrong. Those people... Avoid. If the preacher is not under the word, because the word is above them, that is a bad teacher. Number two, people, as we've already said, who've got new teachings all the time. Ah, oh, said Philetus and Hermeneus, we believe in the resurrection too, but we believe in its true and complete form, not the one that Paul's given you. Beware people who say, everyone got it wrong until I came. From the apostles to today, they all made a mistake, but I can tell you the truth. Do you know, we're Reformation people. The Reformers never said that. The Reformers, despite some bad historical teaching, didn't smash everything up before and say, the Apostles, bad history, us. They said, we want to claim the inheritance of everything that was good. And there's been lots of good between now and then. It's just that it's got a bit all mangled up in recent centuries. They never said, no one got it right till us. They said, no, 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 the old teachings were always there. We stand on the old teachings. Beware those who do not remind you of the old, old story. Three, beware those who, in order to maintain authority, mock you, berate you, belittle you, insult you, and shame you. There are such teachers. I can think of a very famous one who rose and fell within living memory as a, and was probably the most famous reformed teacher in the world who did this very thing crashed and burned and took hundreds with him. What does verse 25 say about God's Bible teacher? Correcting his opponents with gentleness. If a Bible teacher has to put you down, mock you and insult you, avoid them. That is not God. Four, when the lifestyle does not match. Verse 19, let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Two million dollars worth of jewellery and you're upset about them getting pinched? Strikes me doesn't quite fit. I am above the commandments because I've reached this spiritual plane. Ignore them. Fifth, uh, this is implied, I think. Bible teaches who say, you don't need church, you just need to listen to me. Number one, they're saying that because they're, not because they're right, they're placing them above the accountability of the local church. And number two, they might say they don't believe in church, you just need them, but they are building a church and they're making it out of you. Ignore people who say you don't need the church. By the way, some people are very hurt by churches. And that is a real thing. That's a sermon for another day. That is not a reason to reject God's church. It's the reason to find a good one. You might finish this by saying, wow, it's all, you know, there's all these dodgy people out there. Will we be okay? Yes. As we stay close to God, he will defend his people who are standing on his word. I say this because verse 19, it says the Lord knows those who are his, is a quote from the standoff between Moses and Korah. Moses came with God's word. Korah said, we've had enough of your teaching. We've got a better idea. The ground opened up and swallowed Korah and everybody associated with him and closed again. What does that mean? It means you better do what I say, because otherwise 
The ground will open up, that'd be great, but that doesn't happen. It's, uh, what this means is this, God will defend the people who stand on his word. So stand on his word. Use it in your life. Keep your teachers biblical. Grow deep in the old, old story. Listen to teachers that fulfil God's criteria. Stay away from those who don't. And the life-giving word of God will blow through you and change you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for everyone's patience uh, listening to a sermon that got longer than it should have done. I pray that our hearts will retain the good bits in there, that the, the bits that were of no use will fall away. I pray that we will stand firm on your word, not because it gives us a sense of self-righteousness, but because this is the one place of safety, of truth and of nourishment. Will you keep your Bible teachers sound? Will you keep those who minister through every department of church close to you and your word? Will you give them energy and give them trust in you and leave you to work the fire of goodness through the things that they present to the people they're talking to? Help us now as we move towards communion to trust you and be nourished on Jesus who is proclaimed to us through the gospel. Amen.